Good. So as uh, as we said last time, this course is more about knowledge consolidation. So I'm, I'm assuming that it will also cover new knowledge, and this we will be doing in detail during lectures. But the major part of the course is again, as I said, it's a system course. So it, it kind of puts things that you have learned before together into one big system, which is the case for embedded systems. So we'll be covering a series of lectures. Some of you will consider as a prior knowledge, which you have already covered. Uh, some might need a refresh. Some might think it's a new, uh, a new material. But I will make sure that whatever we need as a knowledge, we cover as much as we can during lectures, even if this is something has been covered before, right? And the lectures, they are styled in a way that, again, if you remember the, the system stack we covered last lecture, uh, like operating systems, applications, uh, firmware, hardware, input outputs, et cetera, et cetera. This is the style of the course. So one lecture will be dedicated to software. Another one will be dedicated to IO, sensors and actuators, operating systems. So every lecture has a theme of covering one block of the full layer of the system. Good. So today, uh, uh, today's lecture is one example of this, where we cover software development, which is resonates, kind of resonates pretty well with what you do in Lab Zero. Because for those that started working in Lab Zero already, uh, Lab Zero, is more like a, a revisit or an application of what you guys have already known from 2SH, right? From back three years ago. So about pointers, structures, writing C code, but it connects it with doing it for IO devices and writing drivers. And also it is released not only 2SH, but I forgot the name of the project course because it has been changed like the microprocessor interface course. What, what to be something, what was that course? To DX. OK, 2DX, uh, I believe you guys have taken the project version, not the course version. Is that correct? OK, yeah, so it, I, I would assume you have also done some of this already in this uh, 2DX course, right? Uh, but again, it, it's it's worth refreshing and putting in the context of what we do in the lab. Well, so why do we need to discuss this? Because there, there are multiple uh, uh, development models or programming models, and some of them are opposed to like general purpose computing versus embedded system computing. For example, here I have in this slide, um, we have the FMU666, which is our microcontroller. This is the one in green here. Uh, and uh, we have, so basically this is this is the one. And we have a BC. So one way to, uh, to program, to develop your code is to edit, uh, develop your source code into a host machine, what we call a host BC. You compile it, you first compile it, you debug it, you maybe even you simulate it. Uh, and then once you finish, you target an embedded system device through the FMU itself, right? So if you think of what we do in Lab Zero, we don't in fact connect the FMU and start programming or developing on it directly, right? What we do, and this is the, the, the case for most embedded systems, is it's easier to develop your code, your full project in a standalone host PC through an IDE in general, or using MCU Express or from NXB, but there are Kyle from ARM, and there are multiple other IDEs that are very common for embedded systems. And once you finish developing, testing, debugging, you create a hex file, most likely, which is the deployment file that goes into the embedded system. Yeah. So you do most of your development in the host, and then target embedded systems stores only the final compiled program, the binary itself, which is what we call the hex file. Yeah. But that's not the only development model for uh, more powerful systems on a chip, uh, which might be arguable to consider whether they are embedded or not. Right? Raspberry Pi is an example. Uh, NVIDIA NANO is another example. But they are used widely in high performance embedded systems. And we use Raspberry Pi in uh, the last lab, as I mentioned before, as a companion computer for AI slash machine learning, machine vision development. Then in that case, you don't need to really do the development in the host machine. Why? Because Raspberry Pi itself, as an example, is a powerful SOC that in fact can run a full-fledged Linux operating system or Raspbian, and then you do the development there, right? What do you think is the advantage versus the disadvantage of 
developing on a host machine and then place it in a target device or developing the target device itself. What is the trade off here? What do you think is the pros and cons for each one? So you mean developing on the device itself? Yeah. Yeah, OK, so so I, if, if I understood you correctly, what you say is if I want to develop in the device itself, this might mean I need, in fact, a very high performance device, which is a relatively more expensive. Is that correct? Yeah. And maybe the tools used there are also might not be free. As a hardware, that's 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 relatively correct. Yeah. So what else? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. Uh, working in parallel with other team members, it's much easier to do it in a host VC than in fact targeting the actual device. By the way, uh, if you do this in Raspberry Pi, you can still also parallelize the work in Raspberry Pi if you connect it to some sort of a, um, of a router port, and then you can remotely access it. But it's it's quite, well, I'd say, relatively harder than really doing or sharing code with the PC. Yeah, there was some input from here. Yeah, please. That's an excellent point. This might depend on uh, how powerful is the device itself, but relatively or generally that's correct because your host PC can be even considered a server machine. In that case, compiling, developing, simulating is much faster. That's correct. Um, is there any other addition? That's 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 an excellent point. So your your friend here is saying, well, if I am programming or developing on the same device that I'm targeting, uh, and usually during early de development phases, well, I make mistakes, I debug, I keep kind of. Uh, uh, committing silly things that might crash the system. And if that's the case, and I'm targeting exactly the same device I'm working on, it will crash, right? In fact, that might take it one step further and say you might even burn the device if you are doing something sensitive related to the power cycle of the device or something related to this. Uh, so that's a possibility. That's correct. While if you do this in a host machine, your device is a bit secure, right? Like uh, think of an FPGA, for example. An FPGA is another example of this uh, host development and then targeting the FBG as, as an example. Uh, any other additions? I see that all the comments have been towards better doing the development in the host PC, which is well generally true for embedded systems, especially microcontrollers like the FMU we have. Uh, but what might be some of the advantages? Think of the other trade. Usually in engineering, there is no one clear answer or the one that is, well, one size fits all, right? There, there is always a case where you prefer this choice or this choice. So what might be some of the advantages of really? Uh, yeah, I, I will come to you, yeah, please. You can check, um, like, for example, uh, you have the performance, uh, like if you have a performance target, then when you're testing on your target, uh, you know that you are or you aren't meeting that performance target. You're testing on the post, it might be faster. So you might think that in fact you can well, achieve like a real time target when you actually can when you can put Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's 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 definitely an excellent point. And this is one of the advantages. If you develop on the actual target device itself, you see in real time what is the behavior you're expecting. And any assumptions you have made in early phases, they can be validated immediately, right? Including performance numbers, including having real access to the hardware itself. While if you do it in the host, still the IDE, even if it allows you to simulate and debug, it's a simulated environment, right? Like you cannot really have the full access to the hardware. You cannot really, uh, I would say, in a sense, have the 100% accuracy that you get if you use the actual real device, right? This is one advantage. Did you? Yeah. Uh, I would say the data population is probably an advantage. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 definitely correct. And and this is maybe the feature that I thought no one will comment about because from what I thought last time you guys didn't have a compiler exposure course, but that's definitely the case. Cross compiling. What, what is even a cross compiler? So we wrote here that you need, in fact, to cross compile the code. So if you are running, well, I'll take lab zero as an example. You run your code in an IDE that is an, an Intel machine, x86, right? Which means originally any code when you create the binary, will have 
the ISA of the x86, right? The instructions themselves and the corresponding binary. But this is not going to work for the FMU, right? So if I take this binary and load it to the FMU, FMU has an ARM M4 or M0 processor. It's an ARM instruction set. If you load the binary directly, it's not going to work, right? It doesn't even recognize it. So how does the environment, the ID, enables us to develop code, to compile and build it on an Intel machine, and then correctly work on an ARM machine? This is basically the, the joy of cross-compilation. There is an ability where behind the knees, uh, um, or, or behind the scenes of the IDE, uh, you basically do what we call cross-combine. So originally you have an x86, but you know that your target is an ARM, then there is a step of translation layer that you don't see, right? Usually this cross-compilation is very good for usability because we don't have to care about it. When you do lab zero, you don't even worry, right? You know that the correct hex will be generated for ARM, but it's a slow process. And because you introduce a new step to the system, it's also prone to errors. If you do, for example, target and a machine that is uh, an ISA that is new or that's not mature enough, then course compilation might result in errors, right? Uh, think, for example, that you want to do uh, software updates on the fly, which is something that is well, very common in IoT devices. Like uh, you want to do batching while the device is running, which means you need to cross compile and then place the X file again in the IoT. If the cross compilation includes some of the instructions that are not, again, mature or they have corner cases, it might be very tough to really test them in the actual host machine. And this is why before in any IoT or, or edge computing setup, people have what they call a test bed. So even if we do the develop, develop the development fully on the host machine, inside the lab, we have few of those devices that we test any software update before we flash into uh, before we flash into the actual target devices. So cross compilation is a disadvantage, in fact, in in host machines, maybe because of performance, which what your friend said, and also because of the complications that it might bring up to to the development cycle. Great. In fact, it's it's, it's a very interesting discussion. So thanks for that for everyone that contributed. Um, great. So related to this discussion and related to the constraints we add uh, for the software, so embedded system versus general purpose programming that we have covered in, again, 2SH, 2SI, et cetera. So what are the constraints we have? So we have limited resources for embedded systems relatively to a host machine, for example, or a general purpose computing. You have low computing performance, small amount of memory and storage that you have to pay uh, attention to. Uh, this is basically uh, a cons, right? Like, like you have limited resources that you have to pay attention when you write your code. I just don't write the code to get the correct functionality. Uh, I believe at least I tried my best to push you into a set to think about what happens behind the scene, what are the constraints other than performance or functionality, uh, how the memory is behaving, how the performance is running. Uh, I would assume you have covered much of the performance and big annotation in 2SI and subsequent courses. Uh, those, those constraints are more apparent in the embedded system side because again, come from the fact that I have limited resources. So if you write a program that utilizes so much memory, well, your PC, okay, well, maybe slower, but it will not complain as much because you have a, a well, uh, so many resources there, right? Like you have, a, I don't know, like 32 gigas of, of RAM, you have two megs of cache, and it, it well, a uh, few gigahertz of running frequency. So you are not really constrained as much, right? But if you are running an FMU that is running at 200 megahertz or 100 megahertz with only a few megabytes of full memory, you don't have caching. Anything you do that is not taking into account these resources will reflect immediately in the running time and in maybe not even fitting into the device. Good. So this is the cons. So the pros is, uh, on the other hand, you have a much lower access to the hardware. This is not the case for general purpose computing because these are designed, our desktops, laptops are designed for general purpose users that are not expected to really know much of the details behind the scene. On the other hand, embedded systems are mainly programmed and interacted with, with not general user. General user is only a consumer, but software or embedded software development engineers, which are supposed to know more about the hardware and control it more, right? Why this is an important factor? Because this will play a very important role in what language we pick to, to program most of the embedded systems, which I believe you already know, but we will have this discussion in a couple of slides. So you have memory mapped IOs that you can program directly. In lab zero, you write a, a, like a simple driver for the uh, GBIO uh, LED bins, right? As an example of a memory mapped IO. And you can target efficiency and low latency if you want. 
Uh, another, another. Well, it's not pro or cons, but basically something that is different in embedded systems compared to general purpose computing is that it has a very diverse uh, um, uh, market. Uh, well, catalog to say, right? So I have so many devices. We have so many companies. They have different targets. If you if you want to pick a device from NXB, it will be completely different from ARM, completely different from TI, completely different from another company. And maybe even the development flow itself, the ID is different, the capabilities are different. But hopefully during this that that course, the knowledge we try to convey are orthogonal to all of this. We don't really tie our knowledge to the NXP uh, board we are using, but we rather introduce the knowledge and then give the NXP board as an example. Good. Okay, so I said this forces you towards some programming languages for embedded systems. Uh, and I said, you, you must already know by now that C is the most commonly used language for embedded system programming. Uh, why that's the case? It's coming from this constraint, is you want really a low level access to the hardware. And not all programming languages are giving you this. If you are programming in Python, it's completely, uh, 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 I would say, invisible to you, right? You don't have access to the hardware. It is just much higher level programming. C, on the other hand, through pointers and other mechanisms enables you to have a direct control of the memory, direct control of the performance numbers. Some other languages that might be used, C++, others are not very common for embedded system programming. Uh, well, JavaScript, for example, we cannot really use JavaScript for embedded programming uh, as a performance numbers mainly. So C, uh, this is some history of C. Uh, it was developed mainly in the 70s in uh, uh, Bell Labs. Um, so, well, if someone is interested in history, you can give this a lock. I would rather think if you have few minutes, it's very interesting to watch this video from, I would say, the inventor of C and Linux as well, Linus uh, Trevals. Um, and, well, he's arguing in this video why nothing is better than C. I mean, if you are the creator of C, this is what you would say. But, uh, but in fact, C has so uh, many advantages, especially for embedded systems. This is why up until now, I said it's developed in 70s, so we're talking about more than 50 years, right? And still the widely used language in embedded system programming. Why that's the case? Can maybe I will open this for discussion. So what what why you think C is still the most commonly used language in embedded systems? Yep. Yeah, behind the scene, you mean? Correct, but for example, why you don't to do this for embedded systems? Why we don't in embedded systems write in a higher level language that might be easier or faster to develop with, and then it will be translated into C behind the scene, if that's possible. Because you lose some of the performance numbers, right? Again, you lose the control that you want to do. Still a possibility, and, and by the way, in fact, this is what has what is being done for machine learning, right? Is that you write in those high level frameworks, TensorFlow or PyTorch or etc., which are all in Python, but you might be surprised that those are already implemented in C, in fact, behind the scene, right? So the interface and the libraries and everything is in Python, but the perform like performance bottlenecks behind this in the frameworks themselves are implemented in C. And more importantly, if you are targeting an embedded device, something like the tiny machine learning I mentioned last lecture, uh, you have, in fact, to translate your code into a C-like uh, array. And uh, if you read about tiny machine learning, TensorFlow already has a version that is called TensorFlow Lite, where it generates for you the C equivalent of your inference model, for example, that you can place into well Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and other uh, other other embedded devices. Good. But why why uh, uh, else we can use C or C is the most commonly used language in embedded in embedded programming? Is there another reason? Yep. Yeah, th this is, I would say, arguable because you say if you give more control to developers, also C is susceptible to, if you remember from 2SH, C does not have, for example, memory boundary checking, right? So one of, and we will have a discussion about this later on, one of the most common problems in C is memory overflow that can be used, in fact, to uh, as a vulnerability where hackers can really access the source code. But on the other hand, if you have a low-level access, then maybe you can monitor and write your code in a more efficient way. So you can also, from the other side, people argue it can be more secure. But I would say this is maybe less obvious. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an arguable uh, argument that people 
are really saying there are ones that say C is bad, very bad for security. Others say C is very good for security. Uh, but there are more apparent reasons why C is more common. We mentioned performance as an example. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So performance is one reason and power consumption is another reason. That's a very important point. Most of the embedded devices are operating on batteries. And then if you write a code that is in a high level language, it's well, it's very easy to, to develop it, like Python, for example. Uh, but then behind the scene, it runs, well, it's not very good for performance, so it runs much slower than C. Th there has been some very interesting experiments that shows a very simple program. If you write it in C and you run it in one machine, write it in Python and you write it in exactly the same machine, Python is thousand times slower than C. This is experiment, in fact, you can replicate. I can share with you. I don't know if you have heard about this, uh, this, uh, this news or not, but it's, 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 yeah, it's very famous. I can share it with you later on. But power consumption is an important reason. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that's that's a valid point, but I would say it's, it's, you're saying it's like more um, as back backward compatibility. Like right now, it's already very common anyway, so why not to use it? And right, so yeah, that's that's one reason. But I wanted to go further and why now it's really the most apparent. Because for example, that's true. But if C wasn't fulfilling the needs for embedded systems, most probably over time, people will try to go away from it, and the tools will develop to really support another language. But this is not even happening, right? And, and, and the reason is C is already the length that best fits the requirements of embedded systems, low level control, performance, and power consumption. Okay, okay so we already mentioned that. Uh, we also mentioned uh, briefly some of the problems related to security, including pointers, uh, minimal type of checking, so it's a less strict language. Uh, you require a manual control of dynamic memory, which you can argue might be harder and also can increase human error and security problems. Uh, unsafe, that's the point I was discussing with your friend here. Um, and one of the major problems is that C is not, uh, well, if, if you want to rank programming languages, well, the, the one that is lowest level is the one that is best for the machine. The one that is highest level is the one that is best for human. Uh, C is more in that side than that side. So it's C is more towards the machine than the actual human. So it's not very intuitive sometimes, very convoluted. Compare this to Python, Bear, MATLAB, a little bit more human readable. Uh, but this was intended because, again, it's a trade-off. If I want hardware control, I want it to be closer to the machine. Okay. okay so this is some of the, of the revisions of, uh, well, I try my best to guess what course this part is, is covering, but you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, number systems, that's something related to software development, especially in embedded systems. Uh, I believe we also covered in 2SH, uh, but simply you have a decimal, which is the human one, you have the binary, which is the machine one, and you have the one that is in between, which is the hexadecimal uh, representation, where you encode your binary bits into hex digits. You already know this, so I wouldn't really spend too much time on it, but I just wanted to let you know that this is going to be used. Um, data types. Again, this is usually covered in any syntax of a programming language we have done in 2SH, but why is very important here? Maybe I should ask that question. So why are we are revisiting this here? Why understanding the data types, their width, how much memory do you consume is important for embedded systems? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What the point we have emphasized a few times during this lecture is you have very limited resources. So if you want to define a variable, I'll give you one example. Assume you are writing a loop and you know that this loop will go a maximum of 10 iterations. Then usually, I would bet 100, well, not 100, 99 percent of you that if you are writing a C slash C plus plus program or even a Java program in your machine, you wouldn't even bother thinking, well, my iteration pointer is uh, or iteration counter is just end, right? And from zero to nine, right? But that's not very wise in terms of embedded systems because if you know that you only need it for ten values, end, how many values does it represent? End usually is four bytes, which means 32 bits. It can give you a combination of two to the power 32 too much, right? So you consume four bytes out of your memory, while in fact you need a byte of this, right? 
Make sense? So you have to think of what is the best type that gives you the features you are looking for with minimal resource usage. This is not easy to think of, especially if you develop a very complex program. And we develop this scale throughout the lab uh, from lab zero onwards. So a character, which is usually an 8-bit, this is the smallest addressable unit, just a single byte. Uh, something in C, if you remember, uh, a character is nothing other than an int, right? So characters and ints are really interchangeable because characters are represented as the ASCII of that character, which is usually an integer representation. Integers usually, well, they range based on the machine from 16 to 64 bits, based on uh, what is your machine uh, wideness of the register. Is it like an 8-bit machine like Arduino? Is it like a 32-bit machine like Raspberry Pi? Is it like 64-bit machine like my own tablet or the laptop? But I would say on average, it's four byte. Uh, and float is, this is basically a single precision floating point. It's also four bytes. And double is usually um, eight bytes. So this is the long float of, of the value. In addition to having the types, C also has what they call modifiers. For example, instead of defining an int, I have the capability to specify exactly what type of int do I want. I can have it as a short int, which means it will only be eight bits or, or sorry, 16 bits. So it's this one. Or I can define it as a long end, which in some cases it can be 64 bit. In addition, by default, everything is signed. But if you have a loop iteration, well, this is usually a positive number, zero or more, right? So in that case, by saying it's unsigned, you give yourself a larger range. So instead of ranging from negative something, which is negative 2 to the power 32 minus 1, sorry, negative 2 to the power 31 minus 1, 2 plus 2 to the power 31 minus 1, now, if you take everything to positive, you double your range in the positive number, right? Which means you can use less storage. And this is the advantage of using the signed and unsigned specifier. So pay attention to what exactly this variable is used in. And if it's unsigned, it's better for you to specify that's unsigned. Why? Because it gives you uh, a better usage of the variable itself. So here, for example, if I say it's an unsigned short end, it's 16 bit, I can go up to 2 to the power 16 minus 1, which is this 65k something. Uh, on the other hand, if it's only short end, you can think of that the maximum value I can represent is half of this. Why that's the case? Because the other half went to the negative value. Good. Okay, so here are some examples of how to define those variables and how to use them, what values they can get. So I would say you have enough C knowledge by now, so just for your own reference. Uh, one thing you can check is what if in C you exceed those limitations, right? Uh, for example, you define a variable that is, let's say it's a character, uh, but then I give it beyond the, the value it can, it, it can take. Uh, for example, I say this is an unsigned character and I call it U character and I give it the value of 256. We said the character is only 8-bit, which means it can take from a maximum, even if it's unsigned, it will be two to the power eight minus one, right? Which is 255, right? That's really the maximum value a character can take. I'm giving it 256, what is going to happen, right? So from the result here, and you can check this yourself, it wraps up to zero. This is usually referred to as an overflow, right? How does this happen? Well, when you define this, if you are located to a register, then an only eight bit, like the value of that register is dedicated to you. And once you exceed the maximum value, it wraps up to the zero bit, right? Uh, and if this is allocated to the memory, exactly the same thing happens, right? Good. So I would say 2DI covered some of this through like uh, uh, assignment, test set representation. The last bit is used as a sign, right? You guys know about this. OK, so why these problems are very serious for embedded systems? It comes from the fact we discussed last time. I deal with the physical world. It's no longer an isolated laptop machine that if I do a mistake, my operating system crashes, I go bring a coffee and restart it. It doesn't work like that, right? If you control a physical world through an embedded system or a cyber physical system, if you commit any mistake, it might really mean live losses, what we call criticality systems or safety critical systems as we identified last time. Here I'm giving you uh, an example of how integer overflow, which is, might be when I introduce this to you or this to you, you can say, hey, this is very boring. We know already from second year or, okay, why it's a big deal? But 
if you see the consequences of an engineer that maybe in one day was sitting at a lecture, not paying enough attention to this problem of integral overflow, uh, it can in fact cause serious issues, right? Um, and and I kind of advise you to in fact look into what was the problem that was causing the failure in this Ariane 5 flight in 1996. Uh, I give you here the reference for, for that I quoted this from, but if you dig this up in the news, you will find a lot of interesting articles about it. OK, good. So. How do I know, for example, what are the maximum representations? And this is something we exercise in labs you. So I want to make sure I don't have an overflow or maybe I like I need to guard against something that is not expected. So C already gives you some constants that gives you the maximum value of the corresponding um, variable you are defining. For example, if you are defining an unsigned end, there is a define that is called u end underscore max that tells you what is the maximum value uh, of that unsigned uh, end, right? Which is this value basically we have specified here in that table, like unsigned end would be, um, well, here we're talking about signed short, but unsigned end will be. Well, the value is not written, but it will be to the power 32 minus one, right? Why that's important? Because sometimes you can add if statements or guard or assertions that I will never exceed that value. Here I'm giving you one example of what happens if you have an integer overflow. For example, if I take the max value and add one, we said it will wrap up, so it will go back to zero. That's the first uh, first line here. Uh, but for example, long max plus one is not defined. It doesn't wrap up, right? So th the C programming language standard specifies to you what happens if you have an integer overflow, right? And this is a combination of like programming language standards and IEEE floating point standards. So you have to know exactly based on what C uh, standard you are using, what are the implications if you have a programming overflow? Is there any question so far? Does this make sense? It seems what we have been doing so far in this lecture is revisiting some of the programming basic concept syntax, but with the light of the implications on embedded systems and why we need to care about things that are non function, right? Things that are not related to performance, but rather can have security or slash safety implications. OK. Uh, we have done that already. Um, well, also mentioning some of the basic operators that we'll be doing in the lab, but there is no need to really revisit most of this. I, I will just leave for you. So sometimes, OK, so maybe it's also important to highlight the style. So sometimes there are concepts that I believe worth discussing at least for a few minutes. Some will take us a full lecture, even if you have covered before. And some of them I just want to put in front of your eyes. We need these concepts from previous languages, but I would assume by now they become natural to you. Why do I have a slide for them? Just to remind you that if you have any problem with this part, just go ahead and revisit it, right? For example, arithmetic operations or conditions or logical operators in C, I would assume you have already, like by now, you, you have done so many examples of that. Good. So we'll not spend too much time on. Okay, some of the control statements. Again, we have F conditions, F else conditions, F else, F else conditions. We have switch cases, uh, which again, recalling what we have done in 2SH, you know that both are equivalent, uh, but because switch has some of limitations of what is the expression can be and what the case can be, which is force it to be uh, an end case. If can be, if, if else statements, I mean like control statements, can be considered as the, um, the super set of the switch case. Like everything you do in switch, you can do in F, but in C special into everything you can do in F, you can do in switch, right? But maybe maybe a question. So why sometimes we need to use switch? When does it become natural to use switch compared to F statements? What do you think? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. If you already have some fixed number of cases, if you think, for example, like a state machine, right? Like in hardware, you already know what are your states. You go through the states one by one. If that's the case, that's the case, that's the case. You do that, right? And then 
this is natural or better readable and even better to for for debugging and validation. You redo it in a switch case, right? Uh, but you can still, from a functionality perspective, implement it in F. Loops. We also have while, do while, and for. Uh, all these three are completely equivalent in terms of functionality. Maybe the one that is least used is do while because it might seem sometimes odd or or non and not easily debuggable. Uh, maybe one question is. What is the case where do while is the one that I want to use, given that this is a really used one? Yep. Post test. Yeah, yeah, that, that's correct. But why do I need one? What is the case where you want to do a post test? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that, that's definitely correct. Thank you. So, Sometimes you need to do a post test in the case that you know your base case will always run, whether your condition is true or false, right? Like, for example, you assign some value to a variable as an initial value. This value will always happen. You want, well, by design, you want it to always happen whether your condition is true or false, right? So you want to execute. In other words, you want to execute your uh, body of the loop or the iterations, the first iteration, even if your condition is false, right? In that case, do while seems more natural. But in fact, you can do it using for and while as well if you want. OK, functions. So C is not uh, an object ori oriented programming language by, by nature, right? They don't have classes. No. Well, the maximum thing they have is structures, which you also use in, in, in Lab Zero. But some of the things that can help you modularize your code in C, in addition to structures, is functions, right? So I instead of well, writing my code as a simple one big function, what we'll be doing in the lab is, especially when we go to the labs that have the real-time operating systems and defining tasks and what is the behavior of the task, you want to isolate your implementation of one task from another task. So you will be dedicating functions for this, right? Uh, also, what interfaces you operate with, like if you want to interface to the radio versus you want to in, uh, interface to the UART, you want these to be two completely separate tasks with two separate functions and checking and maybe even unit testing for them, right? So functions are very important for embedded programming. In fact, one line for, but this is orthogonal to, to this course, one line of work for embedded programming, and this is the case that might be, C might, might be losing some of the substance of its dominance in the embedded domain, is there is, there's, there is a domain of programming languages, well, it's more discussed in CS departments, it's called functional programming. Right, so where the whole programming is, it's a different paradigm than sequential programming that the one we do in C, C++, Java and Python, all the ones you know. There are functions, there are sorry, programming languages that are based on this concept of functional program. If if you think this might be interesting, you can you can dig it up. Does anyone hear about this term before or know any functional programming language that might be becoming famous? No. Okay, that, that's me. Do you know? Yeah. Um, not as much. Yeah, yeah. There, there is something that can also be a combination of going something else that ends up being function. That's correct. Did you hear about Rust, for example? Yeah, yeah. So Rust is one of the languages that is really gaining substance and is taking some of the C use cases because it's a functional. It's better to validate and verify, and it's more secure. Uh, that, but that's that's a side top topic you, you can well if someone is interested you can look it up but here I wanted to show an example but this is barely readable but I'm just quoting examples from the lab I want to connect what we discussed in the lecture how does this really impact what you do in the lab for example one of the lab exercises you do is you want to set up your BWM right to control the motor right definitely I wouldn't be writing that code in the main right because if you do that well this is, first of all, an isolated functionality that you can easily isolate and also to be able to test this or maybe remove it from your code, another, add another functionality. Uh, and in general, we can also be using some of the functions from the already existing IDE. Using functions here help us, right? Uh, modularize our code, test it, and also reuse it. Reuse some of the existing IDE functions or because you are working in groups, everyone can take a function, focus on it, and then you come and assemble your main your main modules, right? So here, this is an example of a function definition. So quickly revisiting some of the concepts we had. This is a function call. This is a function signature, right? H. 
which is basically the name of the function, what does it return, and the list of input parameters, and we call this a function body, right? Or implementation. So these are the three main components of a function. Uh, in C, you know, definitely you cannot really use a function, so I cannot do a function call uh, before you really define it, or at least add its signature or prototype before the main, right? So it should be visible by then. Otherwise, your uh, your IDE will complain. Is that good so far? No, it might be pretty quick, but it's refreshing your minds about functions. Good. So pointers. So pointers were, uh, uh, well, I, I always find it challenging for 2SH to introduce the topic because it's a low level topic and has a lot of uh, interactions with other parts, pointers of arrays, pointers of functions, functions of pointers and strings and pointers of pointers, it, dynamic memory allocation. It's a quite involved with topic, but you need to know that without pointers, there is no embedded system programming, right? Like that's that's very fundamental. If you go for an any internship uh, interview for embedded system uh, or software developer or even hardware um, uh, embedded system, you will be asking definitely about pointers, right? That, that there is no other way around it because that's one of the topics that is very important to program embedded systems. What is the main point of a pointer? Just to simplify stuff. Um, well, a pointer is nothing other than a normal variable, but it has one special feature, which is the values I I I I, uh, I hold in this variable is in fact an address for another value, right? So, for example, an int is holding a number, right? A float is holding a decimal number, but a pointer is a variable that is holding an address of another value, right? So, if in this example I define a variable called x. And then I'm defining a pointer B and well, using this AND operator means take the address of X and store it in the pointer B. You cannot really store this in any other value. Ends cannot store addresses, float, they cannot string, they cannot. This must be a pointer, right? The good thing about pointers is they give you accessibility to their own values, which is the address as a pointer, also gives you the indirect access to the variable itself, what we call pointer dereferencing, which what we do in the third line here. When I use the asterisk operator, dereferencing operator, so we call the end, the address operator. The asterisk is your dereferencing operator. If you use it with the pointer, it's in fact giving you access to the variable itself that is pointing to. So in that case, if I do asterisk b equal 10, what do you think the value of x will be? 10. Right, because in fact, what happens in memory is I'm defining X here, initializing it to one. Later on, I'm defining B in another memory location. I'm making the value of B points to the address of X. Assume this can be zero X F three something. And then if I say asterisk B equal 10, I'm saying go to the variable that B is pointing to change its value from one to 10. So this is exactly what is happening with the third line. Good. To help yourself, like remember what we have done in 2SH, always read the AND operator as the address of. Like, for example, the second line, while I'm defining a pointer B, taking the address of X, while the asterisk operator is the value of, right? So the value of the pointer, which is the variable that's pointing to, I want to set it to 10. Is there any question? This may be if, if out of this lecture, there is one thing that I would highly advise you go back that week or next week with lab uh, zero and revisit. Spend maybe a couple of hours one day, depends on how far you really remember that. Revisit the pointers. It will be pointers, right? Because again, without it, nothing is going to work for the lab. Okay. So, one example of how we use pointers in lab zero is uh, in our test function, for example, which is one of the early exercise questions you have. I'm defining again an, an X variable, initializing it to zero, taking the address of this X, put it in the pointer. And then I'm defining another pointer. This is something that is very specific to embedded systems. You cannot do this in a real machine. For example, if I opened any compiler and tried to directly write an address to a pointer, it will complain. Doesn't work. Does anyone know why that's the case? Why this piece of code works for our FMU, for example, or a microcontroller TI device that you have used earlier, but it doesn't work on your laptop? E well, that's one reason, yeah, but I, I guess maybe I should have asked it why in terms of why that's really happening, not what uh, is why is the correct word. So so what I mean is how does it really happen in the background? 
right? Like how it's being enforced. So your laptop is complaining. MCU is not complaining. Why does it complain? I mean, forget about security or or any other uh, ultimate objective that maybe you want to prevent this in your machine. This, this is a bonus mark, yeah. That's an correct answer towards the correct direction, but there is there is still why I cannot access physical addresses in laptop, but I can access them in the MC. What you say is correct. So your friend here is saying I cannot access physical addresses in my laptop, but I can in the MC. Why? Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, we have this concept of virtual memory. Did you cover this in 4DM? No. Did you cover it in an operating system course? Yeah, okay. Because virtual memory is one of the topics that is the intersection between computer architecture and operating systems. What do you mean by virtual memory? So in your laptop, the ones you have open in front of me right now, you run, well, tens of applications might be, right, or at least handful of applications. Every single application is not aware of what other applications are doing. And also every single application is assuming, like if you have a 32 gigabyte DRAM, for example, and you are playing, I don't know, any gaming uh, uh, application, gaming usually is very memory intensive. So it requires much more than 32 gigas of RAM, but you are still able really to run it in your machine. The reason is because of virtual memory. Applications running on virtual memory on your laptop are assuming they have infinite memory. How does it work? It puts most of their data into the disk, not the memory itself, right? So this is basically the, the actual like the values of the application is assuming I have this infinite virtual memory, which is usually 64 bit, so it's to the bar 64, which is like much more than any application currently needs. But then someone has to really do the translation, bring in the pages from the disk into the DRAM, because accessing the disk is very, very slow, right? It's in fact two orders of magnitude slower than the DRAM. Virtual memory between the operating system that is doing the translation as well as the architectures. Usually there is one component in the architecture that helps the operating system do this. Does anyone know what is this component? Might be another bonus part because you guys didn't cover in 4DM. It's called memory management unit, right? MMU. So MMU is the hardware component that is helping the operating system to conduct virtual memory translation. Good. So well, in our going back to the main question, in our laptop, we have Linux which is a virtualized operating system. We have our hardware, which include an MMU, so we cannot really have direct access to our physical memory. This is insecure and I cannot do it. On the other hand, in embedded systems, for example, what we do in lab zero, we are not running any operating system, right? So yet we will do this in lab two, which means what I write is called the bare metal program, right? You write your program directly to the hardware. So the program has full access to the resources of the hardware. So there is no virtualization happening, which means I have a direct access to the operating to, to the memory, physical memory addresses. Good. If you take Raspberry Pi as an example, in fact, you can write bare metal applications, which means you can directly write physical addresses, and you can also run Raspberry Pi, which has a virtual memory translation, then you don't have this direct access. Our FMU later on. When we go to the free R2, so uh, like real-time operating system lab, lab two, uh, it will become problematic on really adding physical addresses directly because now you added a layer between your application and the hardware. Does this make sense? Okay, is there any question? Good. So another thing we need from C, especially in lab zero, is what we call type diffs. So if I want to define something, um, well, maybe I should discuss type diffs with uh, with structures. But but the main idea is instead of of trying to complicate your code itself, uh, you can use the reserved word type diff to define a type of your own. We have used this a lot in 2SH, but we didn't use it with pointers. We have used it with structures, right? We defined our own structure as a type that later on you can create variables out of. This is what this really mean by type diff. It's a user defined variable, or sorry, user defined type that later on you can declare variables out of that type. So a structure, for example, of students, later on you can create a list of students that each one of them is of this structure type. So type diff is usually used in this. And 
type diffs are used a lot in C programming because they simplify the readability of the code. And here is two examples of how SPI, in fact, in uh, our uh, NXPFM66 IDE are using type diffs there. So they really define a function. They call it SPI write function. I don't know if this is done in lab zero or lab one. Do they handle SPI in lab zero? If you remember, if you might see this, if not in lab zero, so it's in lab one. So interfacing with the SPI uh, IO, uh, but you would be using this um, this type diff of the function. So there's a function called write function for the SPI, read function from the SPI registers, and those are defined as type diff pointers to the functions. Okay, so another thing that is related to programming and also embedded systems is memory addressing, and we have one exercise for this in lab zero as well. So again, like I, we discussed in 2SH, but it might be worth revisiting. It's another part that is functionality of the programming is not the only aspect, but also what is happening behind the scene is important. Uh, how does the memory addressing happen in the background? So all our memories are byte addressable. What does it mean? That every single address we have is going to take you to the memory and point to one entry that has a single byte. Good. Uh, which means, for example, I want to access four bits or half of a byte, I cannot do it. Like right? all of the memory is byte addressable because otherwise, if you do it bit addressable, you would need a much larger address uh, uh, register, which is not the case, right? So, what is the maximum addressable memory you have in your system? Well, this all really depends on your CPU architecture. For example, Arduino is an 8 bit machine, which means your address register can hold a maximum of 8 bits to the power 8. So that means you can interface to this maximum memory only. If you have a 16 bit machine, then you have two to the power 16. If you have a, a 32 bit machine, you have two to the power 32. Okay. Uh, we also have few memory types, like we have RAMs, flashes, well, RAMs can be dynamic RAMs and SRAMs. We have IO memory map devices, as again we will see in lab zero, and some of them are unmapped, which means they are not accessible through addressing. But for example, the register file of the processor, you cannot access it through an address. It has to be from the pipeline itself. If I want to divide my memory regions into few regions, and I would assume 2DX should have covered this already. Am I correct? Like heap versus stack, and what do you write here versus there? Yeah, you guys have some knowledge about that. So our 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 memory is, or when you write a code, you compile it, you bring in the binary, and then, in fact, you can really open what we call the obj dump of your code, uh, which gives you what are the memory regions. For example, there is a text region, there is a code region, there is a data region. So memory usually of your application is divided into multiple regions. The most common ones are stack and heap, which I would assume you have heard about, but there is also the data region, the constant region, the text region. Um, well, some of the regions, well, constant is for read-only constants, data is for initialized variables, BSS is also a data for variables, but it's only for zero initialized or uninitialized variable, initialized variables. Uh, heap is for the dynamic memory allocation, if you use malloc, for example, right? And stack is simply, this is any variable local to that function is going to be stored to the stack, right? Most of the time, we want really generally, as a general approach, we want to stay in the stack and go away from the heap, right? And the reason is stack is a more strict, uh, I would say, better secure memory region that is managed by the hardware itself. You don't have to worry about it. If you remember from C, if you allocate a memory through malloc, which right now we say it goes to the heap, you have to free it yourself. So heap is self-managed, which means it's very easy to go memory overflow if you use the heap. Um, well, stack is is basically well, it's it's something that grows in the opposite direction, and the re, the 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 reason is your memory size is fixed, but you want your heap and stack to grow independently. So this is only possible without really partitioning your memory. This is only possible if you make them grow in opposite directions, right? Because assume you only forget about all the other types, and we only have heap and stack. Okay, so heap stack. If I assign, so the first half is for the stack, the second half is, is for the heap. If I want the addressing of the stack from here, and I start the addressing of the heap from here, that means by default, I have partitioned my memory, right? So I said, this half is for the stack, and this half for the heap. 
But this is not true for all applications. Some applications might need more stack, some might need more heap. How to do it dynamically? What happens is that stack and heap are growing in opposite directions. So in that case, you are you permit different applications to behave differently. Some of them will have much more stack. They don't do any memory allocation, so they grow in this opposite direction. Some of them are, are using dynamic memory allocation heavily, so they grow in the opposite direction. At the end, you still have the same memory size, but it's dynamically managed. Good. So the stack grow and shrink dynamically based on how many variables you have in a function. For example, if you call a function, again, this is another usage topic. If you if you if you are in the main and you do a function call, what happens behind the scene is in the stack, you put because stack is a, it's a stack data structure, so it's last in first out, right? So what you put in top is what in fact you use first. So originally, if you are in the main, your main variables and function is in the stack. But then let's call we call function one. In that case, your program counter will jump to function one, and all the related data to function one will brought, be brought into the stack, which means right now you are executing into function one. Once you hit the return button of the function or you hit the exit bracket, what is going to happen? You go back to the main again, right? How does this happen? You free your stack from the F1, and because main is the top of your stack, then this is what you are operating on, and the program counter goes back exactly to the instruction you were in. Good. So your stack grows dynamically by your function calls. Every time you call a function, you bring it to the top of the stack, you operate on it, and once you return, then you remove it from the stack. What happens if I call a function? So for example, I was in the main. I call function one, but before I exit function one, I call another function, function two. Well, you just apply exactly the same rule. I am in the main, I bring it function on top of the stack while I'm executing the code. I hit another function call. I bring it to the top of the stack. Execute on it. Once I'm done, what do I do? I remove it from the stack and go back to exactly where I were before. So this will be your F1. That's why the stack is relative here, because you want something that's last in first out. You always want to go back to the last point you were in. So queues don't work, for example. Make sense? And then we have all this concept of stack frame where, well, the frame of the function has the local variables, the input parameters, the return address, all the data that is needed to execute the code of the function and also return from that function to the original, uh, to the original uh, calling function. Usually when I, well, one of the embrace systems courses I taught, it was in an ARM device. It was in the Tiva C. I don't know if you guys have been using the Tiva C in the, in the second year course. But anyways, it was an arm. It was an arm board, but we were programming it using assembly. So if you write assembly code, in fact, you are responsible for handling this stack yourself. Like you basically load in the stack pointer with the target address. You have to put in the link register. What is your program counter? You have to return to. So you have the very low level control over these jumps between functions. In C, it's a little bit abstracted. So it's a little bit better than assembly, definitely. But I would assume again in 2DX, you have seen at least how to deal with those function calls or what is the stack frame. Is this assumption wrong? Again, I'm debating on you to educate me what you guys have covered, right? In the operating systems course, hmm, that's true. Like how stack operates, how stack operates, like how stack usually in the memory operates. In the 2SI, okay, 2SI, so after 2SI, yeah, that, that makes more sense. Okay, yeah, thank you. OK, we said that heap is for dynamically well, user managed or programmer managed memory. It's used by malloc and then free it by free. Uh, it has the potential issues we have covered into a set already that you can really have memory leak or fragmentation because you keep, you keep allocating different memories. This is what we know what fragmentation is. You allocate something here, something here, something here, and you are left up with spaces that are very small, so you cannot really use, right? Uh, so it's it's called the memory fragmentation. One problem with C compared to Java, it doesn't have what we call automatic memory garbage collector. So like Java, for example, operates this very well because it rearranges your memory, removes anything you are not using, and puts your fragmented memory together to give you a bigger chunk of memory, which facilitates the operation of malloc. 
C does not because C gives you the control as a user. So it doesn't have a garbage collector. So in that case, it suffers from fragmented memory. So here I'm showing you one example of if, if I have this code, I program it, I create the binary, what line of code or what variable goes to what region of the memory? For example, here I'm defining a variable called sum, but sum is uninitialized, right? So we said uninitialized variables goes to what portion? Do you recall? Uninitialized variables goes to the BSS portion. So either zero initialized or uninitialized goes to BSS portion of your code. Initialized variables with a value that other than zero, it goes to the data portion. If you define any constant, it goes to constants. On the other hand, your instruction itself, like the code itself, goes to the text region. If you do any malloc, the actual memory allocated goes to the heap, right? So here, think of the following. I define the variable inside my function called C. This is a local variable to that function. So it's part of the stack frame of the function. So it goes to the stack region. While doing dynamic memory allocation goes to the heap. It's important to understand this because it can create, create security vulnerabilities. You may run out of memory and you may run out of memory, not because in fact your code is not suited for the device, but because you, you are not handling the regions correctly. Is there any question? Yeah. Yeah, when you say define physical address, I, I would guess you mean assign it to a pointer, right? Like assign yeah. it to a pointer. Yeah. So. So far, OK, that, that's a good question. So let's let's say the following. I'll go back to the X and the B example. Assume I didn't define the X variable yet. We know that if you define an X variable and initialize it, for example, it go to the data region, right? We have already said that. If you define like a variable called B pointer and you initialize it to a variable, uh, to a value, remember, it's a variable of type pointer initialized to a certain value. This itself is part of which part? Data, right? Because it's a variable that is, has been initialized to an unzero value, right? So I put something like 0xff3 here. The same rule applies because a pointer is just a normal variable. If you initialize it, it's a data region. But I guess your question is this address itself, right? So this is why I wanted to visualize it. If this address you didn't really initialize or put anything into, it's nothing other than if this is your full memory region, it's an address to some place, right? But you didn't put anything into it yet. Later on, for example, if you made well something like this, now you're initializing this address to a certain value, right? And then, but it remains constant, right? So it, it what I mean is it's, it, there is no variable that really points into it. So, so if I wrote something like x equal 10, now I act uh, like now I have x equal 10. Later on, if I wrote uh, well, this thing has 0xf3, then I have also created that. But you didn't create any third variable. You didn't use this address yet, right? But because you didn't make B point to that. But if I made something like this, uh, four, for example, then you need to go and store some value into that memory. So now this, this becomes like a variable, right? So in that, but it's a variable that has been initialized to a value. So it goes to the data, right? It's not dynamically allocated because you didn't use malloc or anything. So it's still in the stack, but it's somewhere else where this address is, is and it has the value of four. But there is no variable yet directly pointing to it. It's only the address through the point, right? Does this make sense? Or I confused you. So basically, the pointer itself is actually. It, it can be anywhere within that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is what I'm saying. Is yeah. Th this is why I wanted. Okay. Again, like let's assume that this is four three, for example. A pointer has two things. A pointer in its own is a variable, which means you need to store it somewhere in the memory, right? Where it's being stored? Well, it's a normal variable, so it's controlled by the stack. You don't have control of where to put it, but you can control what value it holds, which is the address of another place, right? That's so. There is a big difference between that and that. This is holding the pointer itself, which is this address. This is holding the address of another place in the memory. Yeah, exactly. You can overwrite, for example, here. I overwrote this place to four, right? 
And then, for example, if I say n to y equal to b, which I can do, now I will have another variable called y pointing to. Make sense? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. OK, something also related to variables and stack is what we call variable lifespan. Um, so variable lifespan, so two concepts related to variables in C or programming languages in general, their lifetime or lifespan and their visibility. For example, for visibility, we have local variables versus global variables, right? Any variable that is, well, that's a general rule, any variable that is defined within a local scope, it's only visible within this local scope. For example, inside this add function, I define a variable called C. This C variable does not exist outside of the add function. Why? Because we know for now that this is part of the stack frame of the add function. So it's being loaded to the memory, created in the memory when I call the add, and destroyed from the memory when I leave it, right? So it's only visible here. This is the visibility. Lifespan is related, but a bit different concept. Lifespan is where, uh, sorry, when does this variable exist in the memory? If I leave it as is, C, for example, will exist with the creation or the call of add will be removed when existing add. But if I add it constant here, which is an example we have done in 2SH, C, lifespan, has nothing to do with the creation or destroying of, of the function. So it's no longer part of the stack frame. Because for now, we have learned already a couple of slides ago that constant variables go to somewhere other than the stack, right? So here, we had a region called constant region. So constant variables exist throughout the execution of the program from timestamp zero to the timestamp end of the program itself, regardless of what is their scope. Does it mean that I can access C from anywhere in the program? So we said lifespan means C exists throughout the execution of the program, but does it mean that I can access it? No, that's the visibility. Even if this variable is in memory, it's only accessible within its scope. C is a local variable to the function add, which means I can only access it within the add. If I try to do, for example, in the main Brent F C, you will get an error. C is not defined. Why? Because it's a local variable. And this is what we mean by the visibility of the variable, right? The scope. Is that clear what is the difference between scope and lifespan? I can change the lifespan by adding specifiers like constant, for example, but the scope is just defined by where do we define that variable. If you want something to be only visible within a function, you put it inside the function. If you want it to be global, you have to be to put it outside any other function. Um, make sense? Okay. Yeah, another concept related to embedded programming especially is what we call Indian. I would assume you also cover this in 2DI. Yes or no? Do you know what is Indian is for presentation of variables? Yeah. So what does Indian is control is what is the order of the bytes of that variable stored in the memory? This whole dilemma of Indian is comes from the fact that we said our memories are byte address, correct? Which means most variables they would be stored in more than one address, right? For example, if I'm defining a byte, a byte, uh, sorry, if I'm defining an integer, it would take four bytes, so it might take all these four spaces. Now the question will become, do I put the first byte in the first address, the least significant byte in the first address, or do I put the most significant byte in the first address? So do I read my integer variable in that direction or in that direction, right? And this is Basically, little Indian versus big Indian, right? If you have little Indian, you put the least significant byte in the smallest address, right? So, for example, if I have that variable and I'm using little Indian, I would put 7, 8, 5, 6, uh, 3, 4, and 1, 2. So, this is basically little Indian. So, I would just write this little. On the other hand, if I have a big Indian processor, what I would do is I would put the most significant byte first, which means I would put one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight. Good, and this is beginning. Is that clear? So 
It's very important to understand this. There is no one better than the other, by the way. It's just a matter of convention. But you have to make sure that your convention is correct. Right now, there are, by the way, problems in some existing systems on a chip because they don't handle the heterogeneity of the processors. For example, some ARM processors are in fact little Indian. Some of them are big Indian. And it depends really on what, remember from last lecture, we had the multiple series like the M series, the R series, and the A series. So it depends on what family you are from. Uh, it depends on the Indianness. But you have to make sure that whatever Indianness is assumed, you write your programs accordingly, right? So for example, if you write some bit masking, but you don't know whether this is the first byte or the last byte you bring from the memory, you would have problems, especially in embedded systems where you can bring in data from specific addresses directly because we don't have virtual memory. Make sense? Okay. So, so in, in fact, this Indianness, well, I, I, maybe I'll share with you one experience uh, of practical experience that not knowing exactly what is the big Indianness versus little Indianness is causing a problem. So one of the, um, I don't know if you heard about RISC-V architectures, but RISC-V architectures are one of the, I would say, looming architectures uh, for systems on a chip. This is the open source hardware. It's basically the Linux of hardware. But uh, but one of the very common systems on a chip, open source system on a chip of RISC-V is called Open Beaten. So one funny problem, well, what is Open Beaten? It's basically a system on a chip that has multiple cores, right? Each core is, in fact, a RISC-V core. One funny thing related to this big Indian, little Indian is our team discovered the bug in this open beaten uh, architecture. And the reason is originally open beaten was using uh, well, another big company that is faded in the Silicon Sun Microsystems. Does anyone know what is Sun Microsystems? Yeah, so it was when one day one of the very big uh, say innovative uh, Silicon uh, or architecture manufacturers, but right now well, they don't exist even uh, because Oracle bought them. But the idea is Sun had a very interesting architecture called UltraSpark. So open beaten, implemented originally using UltraSpark. The problem is UltraSpark has one Indianness. Right now, I don't recall on top of my head, but assume UltraSpark is big Indian, okay? So, well, the, the project that boarded open beaten for RISC-V, which is from um, Berkeley, not from Berkeley, from Berkeley University, uh, they didn't pay attention to the difference Indianness between Risk V and and UltraSpark, so they ported the architecture to Risk V. But if you try to run any code, Risk V code on that architecture without paying attention that in fact the underneath Indianness is different from what Risk V is assuming, you will get completely wrong results. Those results are not justifiable, so we spent like three months trying to understand what is happening behind the scene, and all of a sudden we discovered that the bug is in the Indianness. Like you have a risk five core, which has one Indian, little Indian, for example, but the memory is big Indian. So everything is messed up in the middle. You store your variable like this, but when you get it from the memory, you get it like that. Right? So it's, this is one example of it's a small issue. Or it's a textbook, typical example that is covered in undergrad. But if you don't pay attention into it, it might really mess up with big chips. OK. Good, so what we have covered so far is, well, uh, a very quick review of C language, numbering systems, memory addressing, and the Indianness. Uh, so, well, an application example, we, we develop a C program in our, uh, in our, in our FMU 666 and the IDE, MC Express or IDE. You write your source code, which is, for example, this is your C source code. And then you hit compile or build in, I, in the IDE. What is going to happen is your source code is going to be translated. Your C code is going to be translated into an assembly code, right? It is an example of that assembly code. And then this assembly code will go through an assembler to create a binary object, right? Just like take the instructions, like here, for example, I'm doing an, uh, that's a branch list. Then this is a, let me subtract, uh, compare, right? So the some of the existing instructions and then translate this into the binary representation of the instruction. From where the hardware or the, the, the assembler will get the binary representation, that's from the ISA contract we discussed in the last lecture, right? Every single instruction set has a document that you can access on the internet that tells you the added instruction is represented by this stream of bits. The first few bits is 01001, including the add. The second 
field of the bit is the first register, second register, etc. etc. Again, I'm assuming either 2DX or 2DI covered some of this instruction set representation because it aligns with assembly. But for now, I can do this translation through the assembly. Good. So I end up with a, like a file that has a list of binary bits. I cannot interpret, but the machine understands very well. Then what happens afterwards is you need to link because you, you might not have a single source code. For example, in lab zero, you have a file that have your main function, but you also have other files that, for example, header files or functions defined in another, another uh, file. And then you need to link all of this into your code. So after doing the assembly and the linking, now I end up with what I call for NXP, the AXF file, or this is the, well, the loading file. This is the file that's being programmed into the device, right? And then there is a loading step that is done by the IDE for you, which takes the executable, hex file or AXF file. Each company has its own extension. But at the end, this is the binary representation that you load into your device through the loading or the flash. And this is the program button basically you had in the ID. Good. So now we discussed memory mapping in theory, but how does this align with the NXP board we have, the X, uh, the case X6? So if you open the data sheet of the X, uh, of the of the six six, well, in fact, right now I still have the old because uh, last year we were using a virtual machine, but I believe now this document is already on Avenue for you. Maybe I should remove that link. Um, so if you open the data sheet of the FMU uh, board, you will find a table, table 5.1, that gives you the system memory map. So it tells you, for example, uh, well, which part can access which part. For example, this is your SDRAM address space, which is only accessible by the Cortex M4. Uh, this is your SRAM low and uh, SRAM upper. Region. This is your Flexbus access. Flexbus is an I/O device. Um, this is your flash memory. This is your flex non-volatile memory. So it gives you the address space of all the memories you have in your system. Why that's important? Because if you open the architecture of the board, you especially in any embedded system, you have different types of memories. Again, we have flash. We have SRAMs. Well, in, in much more complex architectures, you might end up having DRAMs or non-volatile memories. And those must be addressable by the user. Each type of the memory must have a different address space. From where do I get this mapping? It's from the data sheet of the, of the board itself. Good. OK, so here, for example, well, flash memory, it explains to you what the flash memory is supporting, the SRAM, the local memory controller. Which memory region, what does it really mean? Good, so they basically this is an application of the memory addressing on the board we are using. Another important thing that I want you to know that is related to the safety critical nature of the embedded system is C programming. So there has been some efforts in standardizing some C version that is certified by safety critical systems. Last time, if you remember, we had a long discussion about most of the embrace systems that are safety critical, they go through a certification authority. Avionics, for example. Automotive is another example. Healthcare systems is a third example. Writing code in BUC that was originally targeting, well, general purpose devices, so they don't have memory management, uh, uh, they don't control, like they, they suffer from memory overflow, security vulnerabilities, they might not be secure. Uh, is well, it, it's suffering some resistance in these safety critical systems. Despite C being the most commonly used language in embedded systems, if you really start putting it in a car and then try to certify that bar, you need to do a little bit more effort to make sure that all the vulnerabilities are not there. Again, memory overflow, memory management, all these problems. So there has been some efforts trying to modify the C standard to have a fork version of C that is more strict to make sure it's easier to program with for safety critical systems. And, and there has been multiple projects about this. One of the most common, or at least the, the one that is more successful, is called the Misra C. So Misra C is basically defined by the Motor Industry Software Reliability Association. You can tell from the name, it's mainly for automotive, right? Uh, it, it was defined to make sure that you increase the reliability and security and safety of embedded C. Good. Some of the example guidelines they provide, so for example, you use fixed width types. 
don't use general width types like int, for example. Maybe out of discussion to make sure why this is relevant or why this might be more safe. So such guideline, why it might be proposed. Why it makes sense to use fixed width instead of just normal width. And by the way, this is something that Lab Zero also encourage you to do, right? This is one exercise of this. Yes, please. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. That, that that's that's definitely in the right direction. Uh, maybe I would add that int we said is machine defined, right? Like if I if I want to target my source code, so software is developed away from the hardware. So if I write my certified automotive software, and then I follow all the guidelines, but I leave my variables to be int, for example, that's just one possible guideline. If I target a machine that has a 16-bit machine registers, my int will be 16-bit. But if I target like 64 bit or 8 bit or 32 bit machine, my end variable, so how much memory do I consume and how do I interpret the variable will be dependent on the, on the machine itself. So you take out some of the control and you leave it to the use case. This might create some vulnerabilities because it means your program might require more memory when it runs in one device versus another device, which can cause memory leaks. But if you force, throughout all your variables, a fixed width of your variable, then regardless of what machine you are targeting, all the time it will consume exactly the same number of bytes in the memory, and hence it's more deterministic, right? This is one possible guideline there. And well, the second, and I would say this is very expected, well, for any safety critical application, avoid dynamic memory allocation. And, and by the way, that's the norm. You cannot certify any avionic software for, for, for airplanes that has dynamic memory allocation. That's, that's not allowed. If you see it in the documents, it's just a red line, reject it. Right? The reason is dynamic memory allocation is up until now very unsafe. It's, it's prone to human error. So they want to exclude it from safety critical systems. Good? Okay, so here I have a little bit discussion of, uh, of what might be other languages that can be used in embedded system programming because we only cover C, so I find it's a little bit fair to also introduce you to what you might face in industry. C++ is the second most language that is used in, in embedded programming, and I would say this is expected because it builds on top of C, but it gives you STL and object-oriented programming. Uh, I believe you are the, the last class that took Java as second part of the 2SH. Is that correct? You guys didn't had C and Java. Is that correct? Yeah. So, uh, so we, we pushed a little bit harder afterwards, and I believe since 20, no, not even 2020, 2021, so two years later, now 2SH is C and C++. Uh, but I would assume you have used C++ later on. Is that correct? Yes? No? 2SI, was, was it Java still? Java? Did you why? Yeah, that's Dr. Nicholas' course. Yeah. It was using C++? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I thought this course is using Python more. Uh, it started with Python. So we picked up I see. Okay. 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 Good. Good. Yeah. The, the, well, this is in fact a typical example of using C++ for something that, well, the 3D white project is not in fact a fully embedded constrained project, but still has some embedded component into it. You want to make sure that you run on the rate of the incoming signal, and hence it must run in a very fast rate. Python doesn't provide this. C++ does, right? So why C++ is the second most commonly used language for embedded systems. Yeah, here, well, I show you a chart of other languages, how Python, in fact, has been growing tremendously, uh, thanks to the machine learning loom, but uh, but not in embedded, right? That's that's one thing. So why Python is very popular, very easy to program, very human readable, you have uh, a very wide support of powerful standard libraries and um, well, open source communities, uh, but the problem is that it needs more memory, more storage, um, more power consumption, so it's not really good for real-time systems at all, or embedded systems. And I believe, yeah, thanks for reminding me of the 3 dy example. You have already seen this in 3 dy uh, That said, there is already a trend, and this might be the, the part that's worth mentioning, especially for those that take robotics as a hobby. There has been few efforts in trying to use a version of Python to program embedded devices. Some examples here, there is MicroPython and there is CircuitPython, uh, which works mainly on uh, ARM Cortex processors. Um, 
But still, if you try MicroPython, I've tried it myself. Compared to a native C programming, it's much, much slower. So still, I would, be, I would say we are not there yet. I believe currently these projects that are using Python are only targeted towards maybe high school enthusiasts that want really to access uh, quickly uh, um, uh, a robot to program it in Python, which is very easy to, to use. But then it's not really very uh, practical for real projects, right? Or at least not there yet. Yeah, here I'm showing you why one example that Python cannot really, other than performance, Python cannot really work for embedded systems because, in fact, Python as a language does not have any limit on how long an integer value can be, right? I just, like a couple of slides ago, I kind of introduced to you uh, that even C itself, you want to constrain the end to have a very specific type regards to the target machine. So what if int itself is not, is in fact, not defined as, as a strict type? Right, so that's even more problematic, right? So this is from a security perspective and safety perspective. One interesting discussion related to languages, uh, which is also related to performance and embedded systems, combined language versus interpreted languages, right? So why but we keep saying Python is very slow or performance is not good or a thousand x slower than C? Why that's the case? Well, because Python, fun, it's not because the language itself is. It's bad or anything. Uh, it's it's more because of of the philosophy of the language. Python is an interpreted language, which means you really don't run the source code and then compile it, end up with a binary that you can really run another machine. It doesn't work that way. Python is an interpreted language in the sense that when you run your source code, you hit the run, it interprets the language and run immediately, right? So there is no compilation phase, right? This is good in terms of portability, but it's very bad in terms of running time. Uh, on the other hand, C is a combined language, right? Which means, in fact, the generation of the binary is completely independent from the source code itself. What I mean is you can create the binary, take the binary as far as it's targeting the same machine, run it, move it from your machine to your friend machine, run exact same binary, it will run, right? Uh, because once you create the binary, the compiled version, it just operates fine. But if you think about Python, there is no binary you can take from one machine to another machine. It's just the source code itself. Um, good. Yeah, here, yeah, here I guess, okay, I didn't know that I have this slide already. So I told you that there is a very famous example of how Python and C, that's not the example I meant because the other one was mentioning a thousand X slower in another example, but you can try this, very simple piece of code in, in well in fact in the fmu we have can can we do this in the fmu well you can but indirectly but if you run it another machine like your laptop for example and you want to measure how many clock cycles are spent the one in the left that's in fact uh, uh, a python code that does some function and then on the one on the right is another c code that's equivalent to it uh, and then if you try, let me see, I believe those numbers are in fact uh, inverted because Python is the one that is taking 100, almost 100 X's, like 95 X time, like cycle count compared to C, right? Uh, you should be, I, I already give you the link for the source code here. You should be taking these numbers well, for the grain of salt, uh, but they are an indication. If you, if you run exactly a very small piece of code in Python or in a language versus another language, and you find the cycle count is 100x, like two orders of magnitude worse, then if you are targeting embedded systems, you have to pay attention. Okay. Other thing related to software embedded development is the modeling languages and tools. So in our lab, we use the NXP board, and this is why we're using the MCU Express YDE, and we run our well, we, we developed the code ourselves without using any additional helping tools. But thinking about uh, large scale embedded system projects, even before programming one piece of code, you might want at the beginning architecture full system. In that sense, other tools are being used. And for those of you that already went to internships for embedded companies, they will might have already came across some of these tools uh, where you model your system first, and then you have building blocks, you go inside this building block and program that building block. For example, our FMU can be one building block. 
uh, your motor can be another building block. The Raspberry Pi later on, when we add it, it's another building block. The camera is another building block. And you assemble your full system architecture first, model it, maybe also experiment with it, which Simulink allows you to do, but then program every block separately afterwards, right? Uh, some of the very common tools are LabVIEW. There is also Simulink from MATLAB. There is SCADA, I guess, more, mainly for uh, control. Uh, there is Modelica, which is used in cyber physical systems. But the idea here is I can have building blocks of the system. Later on, I double click on one block and then start programming it, test it in isolation, then integrate into my system. So system integration is one step in embedded systems that hopefully, well, what we do is we don't use any of these tools in, in the course, but, but at least I wanted to give you an exposure of what might be happening in, in real industry life. Did any of you get at least uh, exposure to any of these tools or any of the system architecting part of the embedded systems? No? Yeah, it's simulating. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, by the way, in fact, you can some, well, not the board we have or not the car we have because it's a new car or, or a new test bed, but usually, especially in drones, MATLAB slash simulink, they, they do their best to make sure that, in fact, you can even build your full system, which is a robot or a drone or a car, and simulate it uh, by drag and drop blocks and then program those blocks in their own corresponding language, right? So they enable you to run RTL for the FPGA, but C for the microcontroller, maybe Python for another model of a high level um, well, NVIDIA, Nano or Raspberry Pi, and the full system is shown to it. It's a bit slow, but it's very convenient for system architects. Okay, so if I want to go back to what we discussed last time about embedded systems and cyber physical systems, remember that we had four steps, right? We had sensing the physical world, which is done by sensors, communicate this to a computing unit, then actuate the physical wallet by changing a physical plant, for example. Okay? So if we want to reflect this into what we do in the lab, so well, we will interact with few sensors. Uh, in lab zero, uh, I believe you, for example, you deal with, a, or this is part of an actuator, the LED. Uh, you don't do any sensing in lab zero. You do in lab one through the IMU. You use the gyroscope, for example. Um, but in terms of actuation, in lab zero, do you connect the motor in lab zero? I try to remember. I don't think you connect the everything in lab zero is more about the GPIO and the LEDs and the CN pointer. So more or less, this is an introduction into lab one, where in fact you start connecting the motor, you interface to the IMU. So you well, this is. The gyroscope, for example, as a sensor, and then you collect some data, you compute it, and then control the speed of the motor as an example of actuating the physical world, right? Uh, why I'm having this slide here? Because our next lecture will be exactly about this, I.O. devices and sensors and actuators. Good? So I would say let's stop here. I thank all of you. Well, I uh, you owe me five minutes in incoming lectures. But uh, I hope you you enjoy your lab zero and the demos as well. Thank you.